Hey, what's up guys? Today we're going to talk about coffee and in particular caffeine. What kind of performance benefits you get with caffeine. I want to try and hone down the question of exactly how much benefit you get. Are, are the benefits all the same or are there certain you know, variables, predictors that we should know about? Coffee is the most popular hot drink in the world and of those who do drink coffee, the average consumption is around three cups a day. In the UK, we're drinking about 100 million cups a year or 400 million plus cups in the US. But before we go any further, I want you to fill in the survey on the top right of this video. And the question for today is, do you get any performance benefit from drinking coffee either before or during your ride? If you complete the survey, I want you to tell me, do you get no benefit? Do you get a small benefit or do you get a large benefit? But not in the survey, but still of interest and give me these comments in the comments below. Do you feel it reduces your fatigue level? Do you feel it improves your power? Do you feel it improves the duration, the time to exhaustion if you like? Do you believe that by drinking coffee it gives you more motivation during the ride? You know, if you don't have a coffee and you're going for, let's say, a timed event, does that mess with your mind? Do you feel like you can't enter the event because you haven't had your coffee hit? Well, if that's you, we really need to pin down exactly what benefit you're getting from coffee and exactly what benefit there is in the literature. Now, before we get to that, let's have a little look at the mechanism of coffee and also how it's acting on the body. OK, so what we know is caffeine actually binds to receptors all over the body. No surprise, the major effect's going to be binding to receptors, adenosine receptors in the brain. So when you get alerted by a dose of coffee, you can probably double that or triple that for later. But there's also an effect on the A2 or specifically A2A receptor, and this appears to have direct effects on increasing noradrenaline and dopamine, and that likely has stimulating effects in general, and also mood-enhancing effects, which is that pleasure you get from coffee, at least that pleasure centrally. Now that receptor can be desensitized, so you don't get the same positive effects in terms of pleasure if you keep having a daily dose of coffee at many, many times in the morning. Now beyond that, effects on the body are quite interesting because it does have a small effect on stress hormones, i.e. boost metabolism, some would say as a thermogenic effect. The bottom line is it increases your metabolism in the short term, increases heat reduction, increases catecholamines, and has a lipolytic effect, which means there's a very slight effect in breaking down fats from triglycerides into fatty acids, which can be used for body fuels. Also, in terms of energy stores, it does genuinely increase cyclic AEP, basically boosting your energy reserves. But the question is, by how much? Is it 0.1%? Is it 1%? Is it 10%? We need to look at this in terms of other types of studies. Now, if you want to study this in a bit more detail, I suggest that you go to examine.com type in supplements and caffeine, and you'll get this human effect matrix. Basically, they grade the magnitude of effect on your body and also the reliability of the effect in terms of the consistency and the results. So for example, they're saying it has a small effect on adrenaline, glucose, blood pressure, cortisol, fat oxygenation, reduction in insulin sensitivity, lactate production, rate of perceived exertion reduced, reaction time improved, testosterone level increased, blood flow increased, metabolic rate increased, oxygen uptake increased, subjective well-being increased, thermogenesis increased, but nearly all of those are minor or mild effects. What we're really interested in today, guys, is the effect on endurance or performance. And I can do that by pointing you towards three quite recent but very thorough systematic reviews or meta-analyses on this topic. Now, meta-analysis where they take all the papers that have been published, crunch the data and produce a summary statistic, you know, a mathematical or statistical summary. So we can divide this into effects on performance in terms of time to exhaustion, those type of studies, the effects on performance in terms of riding endurance, which is generally time or power over a set time trial, and also effects on raw power. Now, it was said once upon a time that the effect is only going to be in moderate to long events, but this turns out not to be true. So if we look at the power-based studies, 
You can do this by taking out all the studies that have looked at wind gate, exercise, bike, performance. That would be, you know, really rapid sprint performance over 30 seconds or so. But this paper here in 2017 by Jozo Zwick, apologies for any mispronunciation, looked at 16 studies. The total number of participants was 246, so quite modest. But the take-home message was, in all these Wingate cycling tests with caffeine, the effect was 3% higher in terms of mean power and 4% higher in terms of peak power. So it actually suggests your power is increased. What about looking at the opposite end of the spectrum, which is time to exhaustion? Now remember, time to exhaustion tends to expand you know, exponentially. If your power goes up a little bit, time to exhaustion goes up a lot. So we'd expect to see a larger effect in these time to exhaustion studies. And sure enough, in this study by Christina Marshall, they studied 202 participants. Now they only had six trials that looked at time to exhaustion, but they were able to divide it into low dose and high dose caffeine consumption, three to six milligrams and then above six milligrams. And there wasn't actually much of a difference, but the overall difference across any dose of caffeine was the time to exhaustion in their particular test without caffeine averaged 45 minutes and with caffeine it averaged 57 minutes so around about 12 or 13 minutes longer which I'm gonna say right now is a pretty big effect bigger than I, I expected so now let's come on to the potentially best study looking at kind of time trial performance now this paper actually looks at all kind of endurance events not just cycling and this is very recently published in Journal of Science and Medicine and Sport by Shen. And they found 40 articles with 56 comparisons within those 40 articles and looking at a total of 582 adults. And the overall effect was 3%. The overall effect was 3%. So a 3% improved performance with caffeine versus without. And without would be generally placebo, for example, decaffeinated drink versus caffeinated drink. Now we can go further for you guys and we've actually extracted the data in this chart and we've looked at a couple of variables because what I've noticed in this data set is there's a huge variation on how much people get a benefit of caffeine and that's why I asked you the question at the top of this video. So for example one variable is the caffeine dose of course now if you give somebody you know 0.1 milligram per kilogram they're going to have a very tiny effect. You know, it's not a miraculous drug which has no dose response relationship but it turns out the dose response relationship between let's say two milligrams per kilogram and maybe eight to ten milligrams a kilogram which is a very high dose is pretty flat in other words the graph that you see when you plot endurance performance against caffeine dose looks a bit like this now another variable which i touched on earlier is exercise duration and that doesn't have a massive effect but there does seem to be a slight trend for an improvement as you go longer in a race but only up to the kind of half-life of caffeine which is usually quoted as around three four hours so if you events more than three or four hours you might want to time your caffeine intake as per when you're going to get most benefit for example let's say you're in a road race and you want to peak at the point of the sprint at the end of the race or at a certain midpoint in the race you might want to take your caffeine boost maybe in the form of a tablet or gel one two hours before that actual line before the predicted time you're crossing or let's take a more real world example let's say you're in a sportif you know it's a really long event but you want to avoid flagging in the last third then you might take your big caffeine hit around about halfway or towards the last third you know an hour before the last third for example there's no reason you can't do that either with a quick break quick fueling stop or, or by carrying some kind of caffeinated drink bar or gel or chew or something like that now i guess one point to be cautious of is that if you just rely on coffee from let's say unmetered sources even your regular coffee shop coffee you're probably not going to know exactly how much caffeine is in there similarly energy drinks it's hard to keep track of how much caffeine you're getting in the energy drink even if it's actually stated on the on the can you know because depending on how much you drink over how long it may or may not be clear how much you're getting so if you really want to be precise about it and a lot of these studies do want to be precise they've nearly always measured it out or used a chew or gel or something 
that's got a standardized amount of caffeine concentration in that supplement. Now, a really common question here is whether you have to be caffeine naive to have maximum benefits. And it turns out the literature is a little bit confusing on that. Not all studies say you do. But I think looking at most of the studies, and if you refer here to a meta-analysis from 2004 by Stewart, they looked at 32 peer-reviewed studies and they found that in habitual non-consumers of coffee, i.e. people that were basically caffeine naive, they got most benefit, around about 4%, plus or minus 1% increase compared to people not drinking coffee as a, as a supplement or taking caffeine as a supplement for their race. And in the habitual consumers, so the opposite, those that were taking you know, long-term coffee and didn't really stop, you know, maybe three cups a day on average, then they got the least benefit, around about 1% to 2%. There was still a slight benefit, but it was on the borderline of statistical significance. Now, there was some good news, however, in that the habitual you know, long-term coffee drinkers could effectively get an enhanced performance benefit by abstaining from coffee and caffeine for about two to three days before, and ideally about a week before. So if you do that, you probably recoup about half of the benefit you'd get by being a lifelong non-coffee drinker. Okay, that's pretty interesting, guys, but it probably doesn't explain the full effect. And this is where I'm going to ask you again, what result did you put in to our survey above? You see, it turns out that there's a big hidden factor here, a big elephant in the room, if you like, which is your natural metabolism. Now, coffee is a substance we metabolize pretty quickly with the liver, and it's actually metabolized mostly by this CYP1A2 system. And that's broken down into lots of sub sub variants or sub genes. And it turns out that you can genotype somebody for their coffee metabolism status. And rather than just talk to you about it, I've actually gone so far as to actually get mine done. And I'll tell you how to do it. You can do it with a number of these genetics at home, analyzing facilities. The one I used was called 23andMe. Now what this does is really simple. They send you a packet in the post with a little tube, you spit into the tube, you send it off, and they map you for health, they map you for well-being, they map you for disease propensity, they map you, if you want it, okay, it's an additional cost, for genetics as well in terms of family history. Now, I decided to get mine done. I'm not advertising this. I'm not paid by them. I'm not promoting this. There's lots of other services out there, but this one worked pretty well for me, and my results showed that I was actually a medium caffeine metabolizer, or to put it in scientific terms, going back to this enzyme, CYP1A2, that I had the allele AC, which is a medium metabolizer, but half the population are AA, which are fast metabolizers. Now, what's the point of me telling you this? Well, the point is, if you're a fast metabolizer of caffeine, you'll probably get the maximum benefit of caffeine in an activity. So rather than getting 3 to 4%, it's quite likely you get 4, 5, 6, 7% benefit from a maximum dose of caffeine. You still have to be a little bit naive to that bolus of caffeine and take it in the right way. It's not going to work miracles if your protocol goes wrong. But if you take it in the right way at the right dose, you get the maximum effect if you're a fast metabolizer of caffeine. The medium metabolizer like myself, probably going to get a very small hit like around 1% roughly. And that allies with my subjective experience. But there is another group, the CC allele, who actually slow metabolizes, and they either have no effect, or sometimes they can actually have, bizarrely, a detrimental effect. You know, you take a sports drink containing caffeine, it doesn't work for you, and in fact, you feel bloated, you feel sick, you know, you, it doesn't agree with you, and basically it slows you down on the race. So this seems to be an appropriate time for me to mention adverse effects of caffeine because I'm not sitting here telling you all to dose up on coffee before every event, before recreational riding, before going around to see your friends on the bike. No, it's up to you what you do. You decide. I'm just providing the scientific evidence here and also breaking it down by the predictors what may tell you if you're going to get a bigger or smaller effect. But I do want to say that caffeine can be risky. It can have short-term side effects, obviously headache, nausea, dizziness, twitchiness, you know, agitation, 
can also have longer term side effects, addiction and tolerance potential. You know, one of the things I regularly get, actually, if I end up drinking caffeine, either in tea or coffee regularly, is that when I stop drinking tea or coffee, I get a terrible headache, which is a classic sign of caffeine withdrawal and tells me I'm probably drinking too much coffee in my normal day to day life. In fact, for me, I'm probably doing everything wrong. I'm probably having too much coffee as a baseline. I'm not using the right dose of coffee. I'm using a very small sip, a pretty pathetic instant coffee with a low dose, you know, one to two milligrams per kilogram, or let's say a hundred milligrams in total. And then I'm using it very close in time to a very short event. And those are probably no nos throughout. And then I'm getting like a zero to 1% effect. And most of the effect I'm getting is probably psychological. It's probably like a placebo effect thinking, yeah, I've had my coffee. At least I can make a decent effort. Okay, guys, so let's summarize. What I'm saying today is that caffeine is actually a very interesting substance to look at in terms of sports medicine and the effect on cycling or running performance. It definitely has an effect across you know, hundreds of studies that have been done to date, but the effect is definitely not uniform. The effect is subject to wide individual differences. Now, because caffeine, coffee, you know, is such a regular social drink, it's become very hard for authorities such as WADA to keep an eye on it in terms of, you know, should it be on a banned substance list? But in terms of the magnitude of the effect, to be honest, it probably should be on the prohibited substance list. But it was removed in 2004 because of problems, you know, with accusing people who were just leisure coffee drinkers that they were taking this as a performance enhancing drug. If you're serious about your cycling and if you're serious about events and you want to maximize your performance and you're going for time, then you probably should restrict the amount of caffeine that you're drinking for at least seven days prior to your event and probably longer because the more caffeine naive you are, the probably the more of an effect you're going to get. Secondly, you should carefully calculate the dose and also meter it so that you will have the maximum effect roughly 45 minutes to 75 minutes after you take the drug. In other words, that's the effect that's going to be maximal in your system. That's the peak dosing effect. And if you want to have another effect later, then yeah, sure. Then you have to have another hit or another caffeine boost later on. But I guess the big news here is that cutting edge genetic analysis, which is now available really simply, can tell you whether you're a fast, medium or slow metabolizer of caffeine and whether you're likely to get a superior or inferior performance boost. It will also tell you, by the way, your propensity to caffeine addiction and alcohol, by the way, if you want to look at that. You know, the reports that you get these days are really amazingly comprehensive. Okay, this is Coach Alex signing off. And if you want to check out our Patreon site, our typical donation, by the way, is $3 a month, which would be exactly the same as buying me one coffee a month, which really isn't that bad, guys. All right, guys, thanks for listening. Take care out there and see you soon.